One of the great songs from my childhood growing up in the church, perhaps it's a song that you sang as well, is a song with words and tune and motions. See if you remember this song. It starts off by saying, I may never, and then the motions kick in. March in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. That was a great song because it was a catchy tune. Plus, we got to do things, the motions. Now, I realize today that there may be some quarters where that song is not politically correct. I mean, taking military imagery and bringing that to our children which is somewhat ironic when you consider some of the video games they play and the, the movies their parents let them watch, but that's beside the point. Even if you don't particularly like that song today, I'll tell you, I do. I like that song because it does express some of the great themes of Scripture. I mean, it, it talks about the spiritual warfare. Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the full armor of God and get ready because we've got a battle ahead of us with the forces of evil. And it, it reminds us of that theme. Plus, it also picks up on the theme of service and devotion to our Lord. Yeah, I like that idea. And that's really the direction we're headed today as we continue our sermon series from the book of Joshua. It's where we've been this month, learning some of the lessons from Joshua as we look at some of those stories. And today's message, I've entitled it, The Lord's Army. We're in Joshua chapter 5. We're looking at just three verses, a story that's told in verses 13, 14, and 15. And it's a great story about Joshua and the Lord's army. We'll start with verse 13. Here's where it says, Joshua stood near Jericho. And I'll just stop the verse right there because I want you to understand how it's setting us up for the story. We have Joshua and his army. They have crossed the Jordan River. Told you about that in our last message. Not an easy thing to do back in those days, but the miracle of the parting of the water, and they have crossed to the side of the land of Canaan. Now the army is standing in array around the city of Jericho. That's their first target. It's a strategic target. If they can conquer this fortress city, it sets them up for the conquest of the rest of the land of Canaan. They, they want Jericho. The army is surrounding the, the people of Jericho on the inside behind those walls, and, and so battle is ready to happen. Now, as they are standing there in place, ready to go, the question is, now what? I mean, they're ready and poised for fighting. If you know anything about soldiers, once you get them ready, they don't want to just stand around and wait forever. Let's, let's do this. It's kind of like football teams and baseball teams. I, I and mean, when game time comes, let's get the game going. But they're waiting. Because you see, Joshua hasn't yet heard a word from the Lord, not about the battle of Jericho. I mean, he got the general message. General message is, I, I want you to go in there and conquer this land. I'm giving it to you as your inheritance. That's the general. But how about any specific instructions about how to take on this first battle, the battle of Jericho? You got anything? And God did what God often does. God speaks when he feels like speaking. And God is silent when he wants to be silent. And that's most of the time. This puts Joshua in the position trying to figure out what next. You got your army ready. You're ready. So what does this silence mean? Does it mean we just keep waiting weeks if necessary until God gets ready to speak? Or maybe we're supposed to figure out a strategy and then proceed and, and, and pray for the Lord to be on our side. What, what, what is he supposed to do? Now, I don't know what direction he's headed next. I don't know what he's thinking. And it may be that Joshua intends to just sit there. It may be that Joshua's ready tomorrow morning. We're going to attack. We're going to give it our best effort and pray the Lord to bless us in that effort. I don't know what he planned. I just know what happened next. What happened next was, well, our verse continues. It says that Joshua looked up and he saw a man, a stranger, and he's got a drawn sword in his hand. Now visualize that scene. You've got the army of Israel surrounding the city, and picture Joshua walking and surveying the scene. He'll be, well, in front of the soldiers there behind him. He'll be looking at the city of Jericho, eyeing the target, sizing it up, looking at his soldiers, acknowledging them, encouraging them, and as he walks on that evening, he spots a stranger. There's a man standing there, a warrior, because he's got a sword in his hand, 
and he's standing between the army of Israel and the city of Jericho. Now, in the night sky like that, that's going to be an ominous thing. You got to wonder, who is this guy? What's his intent? What is he up to? Well, he identifies himself. He says in the next verse, he says, I am the captain of the Lord's army. Okay, now, that can set you at ease just a bit, because after all, Joshua was waiting for a message from heaven. It looks like a messenger has arrived, the captain of the Lord's army. That could be a good thing. Of course, we're curious. We want to know, wonder who that guy is. The Jews ask that question, and Christians still ask that question. And one great tradition, one idea, that might be Michael the archangel, the, the one who leads the angels of heaven. After all, in the book of Revelation, we do see him leading the army of heaven against the dragon and his army, and maybe that's Michael the archangel. If you wanted a message from heaven, boy, it's not much better than to have the, the chief angel, the archangel, come deliver that message. You know, the other possibility that Christians have always entertained, this might be the Lord himself. This might be the Son of God in a theophany appearance on this earth. He often did that back in the Old Testament days, make a brief appearance, usually with a message from heaven. This could be the, the Lord himself. Now, it doesn't really matter which option you choose. We have a heavenly being who has appeared before Joshua. He has a message from God with the authority of God. That's exactly what Joshua was waiting for. He's got his sword drawn, though. Now, that's a little iffy there. You know, if you've got a heavenly being with his sword drawn, it could be that that sword is for us in our fight. could be the sword's against us. Boy, that's happened more than once in the history of Israel. Time and time again, as they were back there wandering through those 40 years, there were times when God would send a death plague upon them because of a sin in the camp. Well, we had a death angel back in Egypt with his sword drawn, and that happened occasionally. You see a heavenly being with a sword drawn, that could be good or bad. It's best you just wait and find out what the guy has to say. He does speak. Here's what he says. He says, remove your sandals because the place where you're standing is holy ground. Now, does that line sound familiar to you at all? Because it should. It would to Joshua as well. You see, everybody knew that famous story, just like we know it today. It's the story of Moses back in the early days. Back in the days when he was a shepherd out there with his flock. Back when he was a nobody. That's when God called him into service and made something out of him. And it happened at the burning bush. Exodus chapter 3 tells that story. As Moses approached the burning bush, God spoke to him from the bush and told him, remove your sandals because the place where you're standing is holy ground. He was standing in the presence of the Lord. You can see why so many Christians have wondered if maybe that's what's happening now for Joshua. As he hears those very same words, he's standing in the presence of the Lord. So remove your sandals. You're on holy ground. Now, it was at the burning bush that God spoke to Moses, commissioned him for a service, and gave him instructions. When you go to Egypt, when you stand before Pharaoh and before the Israelites, here's what I want you to say, what I want you to do. Got him his marching orders. The same thing's going to happen now for Joshua. Joshua is about to receive those words that he was hoping to hear, the marching orders from God. And that's Joshua chapter 6, where he'll lay out the strategy for the battle of Jericho. What a strategy that was. You know that story. Wasn't anything anybody would have thought of. God said, take your army, led by the priest and the Ark of the Covenant. I want you each day for seven days, just march around the city. Don't say a word, just stay quiet. And as you do that day after day, let the enemy watch. Let them wonder. Let them be in fear. On that last day, the seventh day, do your march. But at some point, we're going to give the signal. I want everybody to shout, blow trumpets, make a lot of noise, and then watch the walls come tumbling down. Now, no military leader in history has ever devised that kind of plan. Joshua wouldn't have come up with it either on his own. But that was God's plan. And as Joshua has received that plan, that's the plan he's going to follow. He's going to do what the Lord has told him to do. So Joshua has finally gotten his appearance from a heavenly being. He's gotten a message from God. More than that, he's gotten some encouragement, a spiritual boost, and that was something he needed. Because you see, what happened for Joshua on this occasion is once again another parallel between his experiences with God and the experience of Moses, and that helps a lot. 
Have you noticed the parallels as we've seen them last time and this time? For example, when Moses first began to lead the people, what did he do as his first great miracle? He parted the waters of the Red Sea. As Joshua begins to lead the conquest into Canaan, he parts the waters and stops the waters of Jericho. And now both have that same experience of standing before the Lord and hearing those words, remove your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. And then after that, receiving the instructions of what you are now to do. You see, for anyone who's observing, this is just further confirmation that Joshua is the successor to Moses. He, he's your new leader. Follow him. For Joshua, it's pretty good because it gives him a little bit of a boost in encouragement. I suspect he needed some of that. Don't really know the man close, of course. But you got to think, he's got to be wondering, am I up to the challenge here? I mean, who can fill the shoes of a Moses? One of the greatest leaders you'll ever see, certainly in the Old Testament, among the people of God. And how does anybody take his place? And yet he's got to step in and, and do what he does. And am I up to the challenge? Am I the man for this task? He's got to be wondering. Well, what he's being told is a word of encouragement. He's being treated in a similar way to the way Moses was treated by God. And that's going to feel good. That's going to get him ready for what lies ahead. You know, you and I are looking at 2023. We got a year ahead of us. We got things to do. We got plans. We got vision. We got opportunities. And you may have a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of wondering, am I up to the challenge? Like Joshua, we may need just a little bit of a encouragement. It's great when people around us will encourage us. It's great when somehow the Lord sends a, an encouragement our way. Yeah, we could all use a little boost, and Joshua is getting the boost he needs. Now, he's got a certain amount of self-confidence, of course. This is not his first rodeo. As a commander, as a leader, he did lead one other battle. Back in Exodus chapter 17, he led the army when they fought the Amalekites. They're out on a battlefield there in the wilderness, and he led the army. Of course, he had Moses there with him. Moses was up on a hilltop. He had his hands raised high because the way that battle worked was when Moses had his hands up high, then Israel prevailed over the enemy. They were greater, they were stronger, they were whatever, but it doesn't matter. Israel was winning when the hands were up, but the battle ran all day. And when Moses got tired and the hands failed, oh, then the other side began to prevail. That's where two friends, Aaron and Hur, would hold his hands up and keep them up so they could win that victory, and they did. Now, Joshua led the army, but... He did have an assist from Moses, and Moses was there if he needed him, but not today, not as they go in the battle of Jericho. See, on this occasion, he's going to be flying solo. You know what that means, of course. Anybody who's ever learned how to fly, you got a teacher who first shows you, and then as you trade places, he's there with you as you try it, but you know, there comes the time you fly solo. That's got to be exciting and terrifying. Because as you're up in the air, that's great. But when you come down to land, if you don't do it right, you could crash and it's all over. And there's nobody here to help you do it. This is your time to do it. That's where Joshua is. And he needed encouragement. And God gave it to him with the experience of the captain of the Lord's army as he stood on that holy ground. I hope in this coming year, whatever you set out to do, you'll do it with confidence. Give it your best. Are you going to succeed or fail? We'll find out. But be encouraged because God's people can do great things if we put our confidence in Him. But back to our story once again. Back then in the opening verse, verse 13, as this stranger appeared, you notice he had his sword drawn. Joshua's got his sword on the ready as well. There could be trouble. Those swords could be clashing at any moment now. That's why Joshua asked the question that I think was the logical question. It was the natural question. So the question, so are you for us? Or are you for our enemy? Now, I mean, you know, there's two sides here. There's us. We're ready. There's them, and I suspect they're ready. So are you for us or are you for them? Now, you know, the question that Joshua asked, I resonate with that question. You should as well because that, I think, is one of the big questions of life. We ask that question many times throughout life because we live in a world where there are so many issues around us, and we all take sides, this side and that side, and we always wonder, is are people on our side or, or their side? You think about the issues of our day. Wow. We've got political issues and social issues. we got issues that deal with religion and theology and philosophy and ideology, and we are divided on those issues. You look at the last few years of America. America's got this great divide right down the middle. 
You put any issue out there, and it looks like about half of us go this way, half go that way. And, and it, as we split, if we split along party lines, along ideology of conservative and more progressive, among race and social status, and we got all our reasons, but we divide. Doesn't seem to be any prominent majority and obvious minority. No, it's pretty much one side or the other wins, and when they do, it's just by so little. And as we are divided, we can get quite passionate in the fight for things that matter to us. We're all like that. We all look at the issues of the day, and, and we have our opinions. We take our side. And I do the same thing. Now, there's some things I don't know enough about. I just let it go. But there are things I do care about, things you care about as well. Now, as we take our sides, we believe that we are right. Of course we do. Because if we thought we were wrong, we'd switch and get a different side. No, we think we're right. And we stand for what we believe is right. Would it surprise you to know the other side thinks they're right and that you're wrong? Yeah, we both sides do. And, and as we fight, get those swords out, begin to clash, we, we like to believe that God is on our side because we're on the side of right. I expect the other side is thinking the same thing too. Well, no matter who's right and who's wrong, we do very passionately disagree. We get our swords drawn, and those swords will clash. All right, that's all well and good. But in the church, in the fellowship of the church, that's a good place to leave your swords at home. Set aside the differences we have, and let's focus on the Lord. That's the way I try to operate. You may have noticed I don't bring a lot of that stuff into my sermons and messages. Take my opportunity to do all the talking, and I'm going to lay out for you what I believe about this issue and that issue, and, and rally the troops who are on my side, and try to persuade those who are not to come on over this side. And, and certainly I don't want to dissuade anyone from listening to my messages because you don't like the positions I take. No, I try to leave my sword at home and just preach the Word of God and let the Word speak and shed light wherever it sheds light. I always encourage church to do the same thing, that when we're here, this is a good place we set aside our differences. As Ephesians says, whatever walls may divide us, so, okay, let's not let them divide us in the fellowship of the saints. Let's focus on what really matters to us, and that is we focus on the Lord and His business. We focus on our worship and praise of the God that we share in common. We focus on the service and the ministry that needs to be done in His behalf, helping others in this world, bringing them to the light of the gospel. We focus on the Word and learn as much as we can. We stay focused on what really matters most. Now, those other things, they do matter. But what matters more is the Lord and His business. And when we come together and let's do church, let's stay focused on church and on the Lord. You think about that then, as we gather together in the Fellowship of Saints, it really doesn't much matter who's on my side. What matters is who's on the Lord's side. That's what we're all about. Hey, back to that question once again. So Joshua, here he is, he's facing this stranger, got a sword drawn, he's got his ready. He asked that question. So, are you for us? Are you for them? The answer, no. Now, obviously, the guy's not paying attention to the question because it wasn't a yes or no question. It was multiple choice. It was A or B. A, you're on our side. B, you're on our side. So which one is it, A or B? And he says, no. Yeah, he's not going to allow Joshua to box him into something. No, he states his own position. I have come as the captain of the Lord's army. He's actually answered the question, but in his own way. You know what he has said? I'm not here to work for you. I'm not here to work for them. I serve the Lord. What he did was give Joshua and Israel a friendly reminder about priorities and perspective. Whatever we do in life, we've got all types of agendas and objectives we want to accomplish. We've got the motives that drive us, but let's remember number one. Number one, we serve the Lord. We're in the Lord's army, and we're here to please Him and serve His will. That's what they were being reminded. Yeah, that's a good thing to know. Joshua probably had a lot on his mind. I want to win. Who wants to lose in a battle? I want to defeat these wicked people. I, I want to prove that I am up to the job of being the new leader and replacing Moses. He's got a lot of things going. Those things matter. You know what matters more? I want to serve the Lord and be pleasing to Him. It, it's about the Lord. That's number one. Everything else is a number two, three, and four. As you get ready to do whatever it is you're going to do in this new year, all the things you set out, I'm going to try to see what I can accomplish, see what I can do 
First, before you even move toward Jericho, before you take a step, get your mind oriented, the proper perspective, the proper priorities. I am first and foremost a servant of the Lord. I'm in the Lord's army. Now, as the captain of the Lord's army lays that out before Joshua, oh, he responds appropriately. You know what it says? It says he fell with his face down on the ground, and he spoke these words. What message does my Lord have for his servant? I like that attitude. Hope that's your attitude as well. Joshua wants to hear the word of God before he steps forward and does anything at all. That's the way you ought to operate with life. That ought to be a life principle. I want to hear as much of God's word as I can before I act, before I speak, before I choose anything. I want to hear the word of God speak first, and then I'll proceed. Well, that's a great way to do life. That's why I put that emphasis time and time and time again. That daily devotional time where you read the chapter a day from the scriptures, let God speak, and then you pray and keep that, that relationship going, and then go out and face your day and do what you do. And whether you win or lose, you at least started it by first listening to the Word of God. Well, Josh is ready to hear that Word, and he will hear it, and he'll go forth and do what God said, and he'll have a great victory, and you can have a great victory as well if you'll operate the same way Joshua did. So I look at this day where Joshua stood before this stranger, the captain of the Lord's army. I think about the question he asked. It's, it's our question oftentimes. Are you on my side or their side? But you know the question that truly matters, the most important question of all is, who's on the Lord's side? And if we can remember that question, now we've got the right focus. We've got the right perspective. We're at the place we need to be. I want to be on the Lord's side and serving Him in my life. Father, we do thank You. We thank for a reminder from the story of Joshua about priorities, about perspective, about our role as your servants, as those who serve your will, your kingdom. May we live that way throughout this year. And whatever task we take on, whatever positions we stand for, whatever all we do, may we always, first and foremost, remember, we belong to you. And serving you and pleasing you is our number one priority. We thank you, Father, and we pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.